got it. It's being live streamed. It's going to be recorded. So this is Catherine Lambrecht. This is our meeting for August. Okay, so our program tonight, um, uh, Beatrice Ortiz Santana was enthusiastically suggested by Dan Lindner. I don't know what your relationship is, colleagues, boss. He's my supervisor, actually. Your supervisor. Oh, great. And she's a research scientist and fungarium curator at the Center for Forest Mycology Research, which is part of the USDA Forest Service. Beatrice, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. So good evening to everyone. Um, I'm glad to be um, here tonight. Let me see, we'll check this. Um, uh, um, Kathy invited me a while ago and for different reasons, you know, I, I wasn't able uh, uh, to, to do it, but I'm glad that tonight I can do it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself. Um, and then uh, we will talk about the bullets, uh, my experience working with them, collecting them, identifying them. And also I, uh, I will talk about my, my current project with Lexinon. I started learning about uh, fungi during my bachelor um, where, where I took several classes about the importance of fungi in economic, in the medical, and also in, in ecology. And then during my master, I have the opportunity to start working um, with the Orlet agaricalis. And the photo you see here, that's the mountain um, in Puerto Rico. It's a, a forest, uh, the, the peak, uh, Monte Vilarte Peak Forest, uh, and State Forest. And there I was able to, to collect um, different uh, group of fungi uh, for my master. Um, and I learned, that's where I really started learning about how um, to collect them and to identify them, spending time under the microscope and, and, and learn about different genera, including Marasmus, Colibia, Mycena, <clears throat> Pluteus, Posabella, different tropical species. And I did that under um, the supervision of Dr. Carlos Betancu. He was my professor um, during my bachelor and, and, and also during my master, he was my advisor and he was really very enthusiastic and, and he motivated us to, to, get, to get to know more about fungi. Uh, when I was finishing my master, I, I met uh, Dr. Jean Lodge um, and with her, I learned more. My training was uh, um, more deep. And during a summer, years later, after I finished my master, I had the opportunity to work with her um, and start working with the genus Agaricus, um, working with collections from Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. That was a while ago, but recently I have been able to publish many of those species that, that we collected there and that she collected for many years in Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. Then, um, I applied to a special program um, with um, Jean Lodge um, help, you know, uh, to, to start my, my PhD. And this program was, a, a, an, so it was like a co-op student program between the University of Puerto Rico and the Forest Service. And I had the opportunity to enter the program and, and to do my, my PhD. And during that time, then I started my research uh, with bullets and that's where I started learning about bullets and, and studied the bullets from Belize and the Dominican Republic. Then uh, as part of that program, I had a, um, a, the opportunity to work for the Forest Service and also um, be part of the CFMR in Madison, Wisconsin. Once I moved to Madison, I started learning more about molecular techniques and also started working as the herbarium curator and also then um, continue working with the bullets and Agaricus start learning about wood decay fungi, cross fungi. And once I start um, learning more about molecular techniques, then I started all those collections that I did in Belize and the Dominican Republic, I start obtaining DNA from it to also study the, 
those collections uh, using molecular data. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience in Belize and the Dominican Republic. And in Belize, um, there were beautiful places there where we collected fungi. And we were mainly in pine forests and oak forest. And there we, we, I have the opportunity to visit um, Belize probably four times and, and collected uh, many collections um, of, uh, as part of my research, uh, of, of course, I was concentrated on collecting bullets. And, and then um, I have the opportunity to visit different places and meet um, many mycologists there. And these are photos of the mountains there and also all the savanna area. In the Dominican Republic, um, sorry, before moving there. Uh, so from Belize, I studied 168 collections of bullets uh, for my, my research. Um, from the Dominican Republic, uh, we also, um, I, I visited probably twice uh, the Dominican Republic. And there, from those collections that were made there, I studied about 50 collections of bullets. The forests that we visited in the Dominican Republic were mainly pine forests. In Belize, uh, besides uh, collecting, we also had the opportunity to visit several places and, and meet uh, Sharon Matola that she recently passed and she was the director of the zoo uh, in Belize and she helped us coordinating a lot about the places to visit and a lot of things. Uh, uh, she was very helpful. And in Belize, beautiful place, uh, but also you needed to deal with many challenges there in nature. Snakes, uh, spiders, scorpions, also mosquitoes, ticks, ants. So it was an opportunity. I'm from Puerto Rico, but I never have done, I have deal with poisonous snakes, you know, or poisonous spiders or, but we, we do have, uh, scorpions and mosquitoes, but not ticks, I like that. So it was an, a great experience there. So during this time, this study of fungi from Belize and the Dominican Republic was a big project and involved many my, uh, mycologists. It was a grant that was um, for the, uh, obtained by the University of Cortland, um, the College of Cortland by Tim Baroni and Jean Lodge, together with the Forest Service. and. This is uh, Jean Lodge, the person that she was my advisor during my, my PhD. Uh, Tim Baroni, you may know some of these people or have heard about them. Tim Baroni, he was a professor in, in New York of the College at Corland. Uh, Joaquin C. Fuentes from Mexico, Roy Hallen, that he was, uh, he worked in the New York Botanical Garden for many years. Uh, Peter Roberts, uh, Orson Miller, Hope Miller, Clark Obrebo. Life Rebarden, Karen Nakasoni. During all these trips to Belize, I had the opportunity to meet them, to learn from them, and especially from Tim Baroni. He was uh, kind of my mentor who started doing all the collecting trips. He, he taught me how to collect uh, bullets and the characteristic that I needed to, uh, to observe and how to differentiate the, the different uh, genera. So it was a great experience to collect with him and to learn during that time. I also met Roy Hallen in one of the trips and, and then later I published uh, some papers with him. After I met uh, Tim Baroni, he also, I, I also had the opportunity to take a class that he um, used to um, get on at the Adirondacks. And there, because of his help, I, I met uh, Ernst Both. Ernst Both, he was uh, uh, my main mentor with bullets and I had the opportunity to visit New York in several times and went and collect with him. With Ernst, because he had so much experience working with bullets, he worked probably 40 years with bullets and you may know him or recognize him because of the compendium he made, a summary of all the bullets uh, species from North America. So it was for me a great honor to meet him and, and to learn from him. And so I visited several, um, as I said, I, I went there several times. So we went to collect and, and he told me 
these different species and those, um, I, I'm just going to mention some of them like Bolirus rocks, Sanai, Bolirus inmixus, Tilopilus violatintus, um, Bolirus parasiticus, Bolirus rudii, and Bolirus uh, abruptivolvus. Species that I didn't know and, and I learned from uh, them. And also, I had the opportunity to describe these two species with him, with Bolirus rudii and, and Bolirus abruptivolvus. Uh, during all his years uh, of work, he described about 25 species of bolus. So his knowledge was great. And, and it, it, uh, I mean, it was great to learn from him. I really miss him. So now I would like to talk about several genera, I mean, sorry, species, genera and, and, and species from the list that really call my attention um, that I learned. So here we have Bolirus, Bolirus guatemalensis, Bolirus jalapensis, Bolirus projecteroides. There are tropical species. Um, and they were found, the original Bolirus guatemalensis originally uh, was, was described uh, from Guatemala, jalapensis from Mexico, and projecteroides is a new species that I described um, from Belize. Um, so something that I didn't mention before for my research dissertation together with uh, Jim Lodge and Baroni and Ernst, we published um, a, like a monograph of the bodies from Belize and the Dominican Republic. And there we published more than 10 new species of bolids. So I really um, remember Bolitus harapensis, but that slimy uh, 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 ornamentation or of, of the of the surface of the stipe and, and and the pilus that pretty amazing and also the colors of guatemalensis and projectiloides uh, is one that we describe as new and I I haven't done uh, the molecular phylogeny with it but it's it's different it's confirmed that it's different to other species other species that you may recognize is Boletelus ananas, uh, that is common in the southern states, as Sainas, Velocorphilerus conicus, Bolirus floridanus. These are species that are common in, in Florida and in other uh, southern states. For, as I mentioned before, um, this work that I did in Belize and the Dominican Republic was mainly morphology. I, we identify all the species based on morphological characters, macro characters, micro characters. But then during the last three years, I have been trying to obtain DNA and all these species that are here have been confirmed their identity with uh, uh, molecular data. In the Dominican Republic, we collected um, the, the genus that we collected that was more common was Suilus. And here we can see Suilus ertelus, Suidus decipiens, Suidus salmonicolor, Suidus pseudo, uh, uh, pseudo aviveratus. These species have been used in, in, in some studies uh, of the Suidus and their identities have been confirmed. We also described two new species from, from the Dominican Republic, Bolirus occidentalis, that is close to Bolirus edulis. Um, also, we described the Retiboletus vinaecipis, that is also present in Belize. Uh, of a species that I really uh, remember and really love from Belize is Bolirus orissimus is one of, the, of them um, because of er, these colors and, and it was so beautiful and nice experience collecting them because I met the people, the owners of the property and I asked for permission to go there and to collect and then I found this uh, beautiful fungus and um, associated with oaks. Uh, it's related to Bolirus auripes, um, although they haven't been compared in terms of, of molecular data yet to see how close they are. Other uh, bolis that I collected in Belize um, that they need to, that I need to clarify the identification because of well, DNA, I found out that what I was calling Bolirus dupinei from Belize or close to, uh, to Bolirus dupinea is not that species. Bolirus dupinea is from Europe. And Ernst, uh, both and I, we described it. 
we, we, we make a stroke paper um, where we also mention the presence of Bolirus dupinin in Iowa. After I obtained the DNA, I compare with the with those um, with sequences from Dupinia from Europe, and they don't match. So this actually may represent an, a different species that I need to work with uh, at some point. I'm also working with Tylopilus, and and I found out that what I was calling as Tylopilus biolatintus um, is not is not that species. This is the one collected uh, that I collected with Ernst and that he described as one of his species, and we thought that that was the same, and this is from Belize, but now their DNA uh, doesn't match, so this one from Belize may represent a different species. And this is what happens now with, um, now that we have the molecular data, I mean, it's, I think that is a very important tool, because sometimes when we are just describing based on morphology, we can make mistakes. And, and sometimes we, we don't collect the specimens when they're in different stages. We can collect probably they're, when they're mature. Like this Tylopilus, I'm pretty sure that is a very uh, immature collection and that the color of the, the pilots will fade when it's older. So that can happen with many, with many collections and, and, and DNA will help us uh, to catch those things that we cannot see um, with the morphology. So now uh, I'm going to start talking about Lexinon. Uh, I'm pretty sure that all of you have collected Lexinon and, and, and know Lexinon in terms of, of the genus or of what, what it is. So I met uh, Michael Kuo um, many years ago and, and in, in one of the Smith forests in, in Michigan. And after that, we talk about it and we decided to work with this genus. So the genus uh, Lexinon, uh, based on the work I did uh, with, um, with Michael, uh, consists of species like this um, that you can, like a body that have the fleshy, the fleshy, like fleshy mushrooms. And but also with DNA, we know that there are other a group of fungi that are related to lexinon that are the sequestrate fungi. Um, there, this, um, this genera includes Chamonixia, Octaviania, Rosbivira, Turmalinia. And this how, is how they look, are truffle-like uh, uh, mushrooms. But um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, later about the, the, paper, the first paper we work on. Uh, uh, but I just want to say in general that even though they look so different, they're related in terms of the DNA. And, but today I'm just going to talk about lexinon, I mean the body like uh, lexinons. Um, we propose to, to put all of these um, genera in the, within the, the genus lexinon, but it's only a, a hypothesis or something that is proposed, but um, the people that are working with this fungi, they don't really necessarily agree because, for example, Octaviana is a genus that has many, many species. And so, but they're related. And what will happen at the end, we don't know because there's still a lot of species to sequence, and not all the sequence, the lexinon species have been sequenced. So there are a lot of them, and that's one of the reasons where we're studying the genus. So uh, lexinon. Uh, the Thai species of the genus is Lexinon aurantiacum, and this is a picture of it, and it's an European species. So you may have seen many species similar to this, but we don't know for real yet if we have Lexinon aurantiacum in the States. So there are about 130 species of Lexinon, and here I'm including those that are grouped under Lexinon and Lexinellum, so a total of about 130 species worldwide and um, about 30 of them are from Europe, have been reported from Europe. And from the States, we have about 85 uh, species described of, of Lexinum. Believe it or not, but 54 of those species have been, were, were described from Michigan. And nine from California, seven from Idaho, six from Alaska, nine from other states. So why do we study the genus Lexinon? As you can see, it's a, a genus that is somewhat 
uh, is easy to recognize in terms of the, because you are gonna notice the, the ornamentation of the style that will call your attention. And that's one of the first things to, to distinguish the genus. So, but when you're talking about species, it's not that easy to identify them. Yes, you can look and say, oh yes, this is a lexinon, but I don't know how many have that the, the certain amount to, de to describe and, or to tell which, which species is what, is what, is which. We also want to provide new collections with well-documented vouchers. We want to confirm morphological species using molecular data and for ecological documentation. So we have more information about the host um, with the plants that are related. So when, you, when you're describing the xinon, you consider the color of the pilots of the cat. You also consider um, the color of the tubes or and pores, the hymenophore. You also need to cut the, the basidiocarp in order to see the color of the context and any change in color after you bruise it or after you cut it. And also another characteristic that the taxonomists have been considering is the, is the presence of uh, like a, an appendiculated margin in the pilus. That's another characteristic. Uh, you can, and then you were, you're gonna concentrate on the ornamentation of the style that is what is called scabros or it has scavers. And these scavers, um, they can change in color. They can start pale and then they will become brown or, or black. On a few species, they will just still stay pale. And then you will also consider micro characters. They have beautiful caulocystidia because of the arrangement of the style, big and, and very impressive. In terms of the ecology, so we know that they're mycorrhizal and they are associated with different plants in the orders, Phagelis, Pinealis, Ericalis, and they have been, um, they grow associated with different genera, but those that I have seen so far, they have been associated with Quercus, uh, Quercus betula or Populus. So when we talk about Lexinon and we look at the taxonomy, we know that taxonomy was based mainly in morphological characters and the story uh, starts in the, uh, 1800s, you know, 1821, when Gray is the one that um, introduced the genus, but there he was including species from different genera, like Lexinon, like Gyroporos, Boliros, Suelos, Chertiporos, Cerocomos. Then Fries um, included species there that, that were part in the genus Boliros. Then we, 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 we start seeing that mycologists and taxonomists, they start separating them. And, and in this case, first they consider the appendiculated margin and then peg, um, start looking for all those that will have um, the hymenophore or, or the pores and tubes white or whitish, and they will be placed in, in that genus. And Snell later is the one that proposed the concept of lexinos as we know more uh, today. And main reference that you may have heard and that you may know, the Smith and Tears of the Bodies of Michigan. And, and there they, they really describe many species. And I'm gonna talk more about this later. Smith and Tears and Singer are the main um, taxonomical um, descriptions or, or arrangements. Um, the classification that, that we have been using and, and that has been used in the States for them. So Smith and Tears, they, they recognize three sections, um, the section like Sinon, Scabra, Lutus Scabra, and they consider their, the, the presence of the, the appendiculated margin. And also they study the, the surface of the pilus and the height of the, of the cuticle of the pilus. And then color of the pilots, and then they consider also the the changes in the in the context when you uh, bruise it uh, or expose it uh, to a color that was going to start with gray and then would turn like uh, grayish brown or or vinaceous like a, a reddish um, 
color. And they also um, consider uh, those that have some kind of yellow staining and also those that have no margin uh, on the on no appendiculated margin on the pylos. So Singer then uh, he used four sections, luteus cabra, lexinum, rosius cabra, and exenia. And, and for, Lex, for Singer, he just considered all those bullets that have a similar ornamentation of the style, like those cabros, you know, like that, that dry uh, squamous surface. He just put all those species there under lexinum, and, and then he would separate them by the color of the tubes and, and pores, and also he he will stu he study also the pilepilis and, and, and the I mean the surface of the pilos and to separate the different species. And Russo's cabra is the one that we know um, that is now in Haria uh, with the chrome yellow at the base and exenia that have a different um, spore print color. And also then we have other people that work um, in Europe, um, Sutara, and he included all the include many species of bolitos that also have that kind of a, a similar ornamentation on this type. Then Lanoi and Stadus, they, they work with the European uh, species and they recognize about 30 species and they use um, the, the anatomy, the type anatomy and the, the pilot pilepilis structure to separate species. And also they study the different association with, 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 with kind of what kind of holes they were associated with, like with birch and, and then if there were changes in the context to gray or black and, or if there was no change and it, or if they were not associated with birch. And then also you're gonna see that we have a group of in Lexinon that most of the Lexinon species will have a white hymenophore and a whitish or pale, but some of those are, have been placed in the like, genus like Sinelon, they have a um, yellow hymenophore. So this is kind of a summary of those um, sections that have been mentioned. It, um, here we see the sections proposed by Smith and Tears and Singer all together, section like Simon, section Scarra. And, so section, uh, section luteus cabra, fumosa, and lexinum. And from here, we can see that section luteus cabra, that those are the ones that with yellow hymenophore have been placed in lexinellum. And the, the section luteus cabra then became, uh, is not a lexine, part of the lexinum anymore, it's part of the genus Haria. So then for taxonomy and phylogeny, and this is, um, just to mention that there have been several papers or, or studies uh, of lexinon using molecular data. And the one that, the first one, uh, it was in 2000 by Binder and Bessel. And I will talk a little bit more about that this later. Um, then Brzezinski in 2003, he the one that proposed the genus Lexinellum. Then Baker, I don't know the pronunciation, but uh, and many others uh, and other researchers, they they study, they did several studies of lexinon from Europe and using the ITS region, region and they study host and and they're good studies and and um, it's like the first attempt to <clears throat> to study the the species that are in in under lexinon using molecular data and especially, but these are mainly from species present in Europe. And then Sutara, he erected the genus Hemilexinon, and I will talk about this a little bit uh, later. Halin and, and others also proposed the genus uh, Sutorius for Bolirus exenius and Haria for Lexinon chromapis. And then there have been many other studies that talk about uh, lexinon in general. Um, there are different studies of, of the family Boletaceae that include, uh, include um, different species of lexinon, but these are, and, and all these studies also, 
they mentioned the, the close relationship of the lexinon and lexinero species with those of the sequestrate fungi. So this is the first study that I mentioned of, of in terms of phylogeny um, uh, of the lexinon using um, molecular data. And here it was um, the region they use um, is the LSU of the ribosomal DNA, nuclear ribosomal DNA. And this is um, a region that is kind of conserved, but then still they were able to separate different groups of those uh, species that have been placed on or related to lexinum because of the ornamentation of this type. And here we can see that they have a, a group of species that were under lexinum and section lexcabra, lexinum and scabra, and these are still under lexinum today. And they work with other species that <clears throat> were under bolitus, and, and these are now under lexinellum, and these are those species that have the yellow hymenophore. Here um, you can see Bolirus longiburkipes and Bolirus rubrocontus and subglabripes. And this, this um, sequence uh, of longiburkipes, um, one of these was not right, uh, the, probably the subglabripes because it doesn't belong to, to lexinon or Bolirus is now um, in hemilexinon. So, that sequence wasn't right, but longiculpipus is right, and and these are, are species that have been now uh, recently placed on under for a while in Lexinellum. So here, what I mentioned before, Haria is that genus created for <coughs> Lexinellum chromapis, and there are more species now under Haria, probably six or seven, and 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 here. Uh, Emilexinon for, for those bolitus that have that ornamentation, but they're not lexinon. And here uh, is supposed to go uh, Sultorius for Exinius, that is the other uh, species that have that ornamentation, but is not a lexinon. I'm going to talk a little bit about the project I did with Michael, who uh, several we, I, I start. Um, collecting DNA uh, sequences for many collections of of bullet of members of the bulletaceae in general. Um, this tree that you see here is only a part of that paper, and this is uh, what we call the lexinon clay or lexinoid uh, clay that includes members of the family lexinoidea. And here for this study, we work with different. DNA markers, the LSU, TEF, and RPV2. And this is a more broad work uh, in terms, so we wanted to see how many species will group uh, close to lexinon and what is called the lexinoid fungi that are those related to lexinon. And here we can see that based on these genes and, and this data, it looks like it's a monophyletic group um, that includes all the different species of lexinon, lexinellum, and here are also the sequestrate fungi. So he, here we have some places that is not completely resolved, but we can see that they're all related. All those that you see in blue are sequences of, of uh, taxa from the states. And our desire is to increase the the molecular data available for, for lexinon. So here is a start and all of those blue, we, we are different species that we were able to confirm using molecular data. But we didn't use ITS and I will talk about that later for this tree because we were talking about a more broad uh, classification. So here we included um, species of lexinon, lexinellum and those of bolirus, that is bolirus, um, Long, longiculbipes that is up down here that now we know that is close to lexinon. So I mentioned before that the Thai species of the genus is lexinon aurantiacon and is over here. So all these species are related to, to the type species. And that we use as a reference to see how close or distant are of the concept of, of what we have about what lexinon is. 
So for the our work and the species limitation in the xinon, um, we wanted first, you know, to sequence the Thai species of Thai specimens of, of the genus in the states, uh, starting at least with the, the states uh, from a species. And we know that there are about 70 Thai species in Michigan, in the, in the herbarium in the University of Michigan, and also about 10 species in the San Francisco um, herbarium, State University herbarium. And so we requested these specimens and I have been trying to obtain DNA from these samples. These samples can be 30 to 40 years old. So it has been a, a challenge to obtain the DNA, but I have some so far. So, so what our desire, I mean, our, our goal is to sequence those uh, as many species as possible of the genus Lexinon. And in order to, to compare to confirm the species identity, we started with, with the type specimens because they're the main reference for the different species that have been described. So um, our goal is to obtain the ITS and LSU of, of those uh, type specimens. And then once we have that, uh, um, and also sequencing about 250 more recent collections of Lexinum from different states, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, Texas, Colorado, Washington. These are collections that have been made, made by many people and provided or most of them by Michael Kuo that people have sent them. Um, so I started working with many of these collections, but I don't have ITS sequences of all of them yet. And I'm also sequences material from Belize and the Domin and, and, and Costa Rica. So the, the marker that we're using um, for, for to, to determine the species of the limitation, the limitation in the exinos is the ITS. This marker um, is part of the, I mean, this region is part of the ribosome, the nuclear ribosomal RNA. And it has several characteristics that are good to first is considered the primary fungal barcode marker. So there are many species uh, that have been, there are many sequences of ITS for many species uh, in, available so that you can compare. And also uh, the ITS, um, I'm gonna try here. So this is the portion, um, this is what is called a, a tandem, tandemly repeated copies of this gene. So here we have the, small subunit and the large, so here is just look at this piece here, the small subunit, the large subunit. So these um, are repeats and then, so the area that we are working with is just the spacers that are here and here you can see the better. And these spacers, they have variation. I mean, they, they have um, a, a rapid um, evolutionary rate, you know, they change um, fast and they have been used for, for many researchers to separate species. So I'm trying to obtain this portion here and because we, and we're working with all specimens, what I have been doing, uh, all this region here that includes the spacer is what is called ITS. So this, re this portion here is called the ITS1 and this is the ITS2. So I've been uh, in Lexinon, the size of all the ITS can vary and it can go from 600, 700 to 900 base pairs. So it's very difficult to obtain it um, from once, uh, try all that region all together. Um, so I'm trying to obtain small pieces uh, first, the, ITS1 and then the ITS2 and then to combine that to finally obtain all the ITS of the species. So problems that we have with the ITS is that uh, it's good that it's, it, there is a lot of it in the in cells so it should be easier to, to, to isolate. But when you start comparing and trying to align it's very difficult to align um, between distantly related species and in a genus and occasionally it's lack of variation among closely related species. So 
we are talking about the genus and when you compare species that have been placed in Lexinum with those in Lexinellum, they're very difficult to align. Um, some species, and we're gonna see that in a moment that are under Lexinum, you don't see a lot of variation um, in the DNA. So in, in Lexinum then, the ITS can be from 300 to 500 base pairs or nucleotides. The 5.8 region that is a, a conserved region um, can be of 160 nucleotides and the ITS2 of about 300 to 400 nucleotides. So, so far I have been success in obtaining the ITS2 um, portion of the, of the ITS for 48 collection of the of Thai species. So that's good because of about 70 that we have in, I'm working first with those uh, types that were deposited in Michigan and from 70 collection, I already have the ITS2 of 48 collections. And I have also a portion of the LSU that is the larger um, subunit um, of petty collections. The LSU is more concerned, but it should also help to place, um, to separate these species. So what we have here with, I'm just working here, this tree is just with the ITS2 sequences and we can see that there are some species that you can probably separate, but there are still some that are not resolved. We don't know if all these species are the same or not. And based on this tree, yes, they might be, they're probably the same, similar species. But since this is just ITS2, um, based on what I have seen, uh, ITS2 is probably more conserved than ITS1. So my, I'm gonna try, I have ITS1 of several collections, but not that many. So my, my plan is to then try to obtain the ITS1 region to see if there, we can separate this or we can clear or resolve all these groups. Um, in this case, that all of them seem to be so close, to so close to each other, but we have others that are different. Same thing with the LSU here, we cannot separate these species right now. So what I did then, I, for those type uh, species sequences, I also added um, other sequences that have been generating of collections from Michael or, or that we have uh, in our herbarium. Some made in Michigan, in Washington, in Minnesota, and this collection that we also have in Madison that were made in Minnesota. And, and, and here, Still, when you can see, we have, yes, we can have some species that start being more defined or, or separated from each other. Um, so we can see that these species here are related, Cofeatum, Lutinopalins, Palidisipes, Alaska, Alaskanons. So they might be related. Um, we have here a good group of Snellii, that is this one that is here. Snellia, um, that collection from New York, from New Jersey, and they, and this is the type. Everything that is black here are Thai species, and the blue are collections that we have that are more recent. So we can see that we have some groups, and that we know that subgranulosum is uh, is close to Snellia. And here we have another situation that is not resolved, so we cannot set what they are. Here we have um, Lexinum holopus, and those um, sequences on, in red, they are from Europe. And I just use this as a reference because some species of holopus, have, um, we have the holopus variety americanus that is from America, but we have holopus described from Europe also. Um, so, but at least we see a good group here for holopus, and this is the uh, a photo of holopus from, from the States. And then we have here uh, the Thai species that all of these are synonym of Aurantiacum, Populinum, Quercinum, they're all the same. Uh, Populinum and Quercinum are, are synonyms of Aurantiacum. So this is a good evidence of where the 
the gene, the type species of the genus is placed, and then we can use that as a reference to determine if we have Aurientacum uh, species, for example, in, in the states. And the Aurientacum described by Smith and Tears um, from Michigan are here, Aurientacum intermedium and Aurientacum pallidipes. So they may be different. I mean, we can see that this is a nice uh, group here, separate, I don't know how many species, uh, sorry, nucleotides are different. Probably not that many because these are, you can see that these are very close and related to each other. So, but yes, uh, what we can see here is that at least adding more species, we would probably be able to resolve more this tree and, and which species are related with. And here we can see what we're calling Durius curum, that is a, a European species. But here I have the Durius curum from Europe and these are the color, what we are calling the risky So they might be, they're probably different species. Um, here we have another one <clears throat> that we don't know what it is. Um, then we have a Monticola that is from Costa Rica. That is um, over here, sorry. Here is Monticola that is from Costa Rica. And then we have Insigne over here. That is this one. And then we have all these, um, uh, an SP that are, all these collections here are close to each other from Minnesota and they may represent in the same species. So what we can see here, um, we can see a pattern of, of these uh, species here. We can see clear that they have a white hymenal form. I mean, the, the tubes and the pore and they're whitish and pale. And here we can see, um, that they're white, but the, the color of the pilos is more orange. All these uh, species here, Monticula, we have also subtestation, I copied this from, from the internet, and Aurentiacum. All of these have some similar colors to Aurentiacum. So next I need to check, once I have the ITS1, ITS2, uh, I'm hoping that the all these can be more resolved and we will know more about which species do we really have and are out there. Um, once we have that, then we, we can see which morphological characters are good to separate species because here we can see that the pilos color here is so similar to Aurantiacum. So Aurantiacum is here, but we can see, that I need to see how many species from here have similar colors. Um, so other group that, that we don't have any, any sequence so far from Michigan that will go to this group. And this is where some people will call Lexinellum now of the ones with yellow hymenophore, um, are here under this group here that includes uh, Lexanum rugosiceps that you may have collected that and recognized that with the yellow hymenophore. And but we have so many collections that we don't know what species they are yet. Here we have good longicut vipes that it was on, in Bolitus before and now is close related to this group, but we don't know exactly to which species it is close. So this is uh, another group that is not completely uh, resolved. So we, we, here we have, for example, collections from Belize and new species that we describe it as Bialocetinton, difficult to pronounce these names. Uh, and when I did the, the uh, when I obtained the DNA, I also received a message from Alan Besset that he told me about to compare that collection from, with um, Lexinum Chalibayum from Florida. So these species uh, that we describe as no may represent actually Chalibayum. So we're gonna uh, lose this name and probably this is gonna become uh, a synonym of this. But we still have another sign from Belize that, that's still different, is Viscosum that I described with, with Roy Hallen. So that may stay as a different species. Here we have Talamanca from, from Costa Rica, and we have then 
the longitudinal vipers from from uh, New York. Um, then we have here albellum that, like Sinon albellum, that is an European species, but we have several uh, species in the states that we think that they are and, and uh, albellum. And but here you can see that it has a white um, a hymenophore uh, of the tube, so it's different to the others. And it's related to Tablense from Costa Rica. And I don't, I don't have a picture here of Tablense, but yes. Interesting uh, result, and, and we need to look how different these species are. And then we have Percophilon here, all separate. That is here, uh, a new species that Michael described from from Illinois. And then we have what we're calling Crossipodium. But when you take a look, this is a Crossipodium from Italy, and and this is what we are calling. So they, it may be different. So. So this is what we have so far, and 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 is is a, a good experience to work with all, all of these uh, species, but it's a challenge also. And I hope that once I have more DNA sequences, um, I will be able to to separate the species and to confirm what we really have. So next, I need to continue working, obtaining the DNA from the types and to obtain the ITS-1 because I don't know much about that. I need to see how much variation is there and if it's be, it would be better than the ITS-2 to separate species to continue obtaining LSU because it's, it's easier to obtain the LSU portion than ITS. And I will, con we will con I continue sequencing recent collections and then we'll run phylogenetic analysis to see which ones will be closer to the others Probably we will be describing new species and then we will develop uh, new keys and new guys and we should be able to also at the end of this project to define the genomes in terms of, of which sections are out there. So thank you very much for your attention and I also um, we are grateful and we thank all the herbarium creators that help us obtaining all the collections and also all the collectors. And I also thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I will try to answer. Thank you. Well, Charles says, thank you so much. What a great and informative first meeting. Oh, Claire, sorry. Um, thank you so much. What a great and informative first meeting. I learned a lot. That's how I feel about every meeting, practically. Oh yes, yeah. somebody is mentioning about the the colors. So a lot of, of the bolids, um, the the in the genus Bolidus, we we know that that they um, stain a lot of them when you cut them or are exposed to blue, and it's related with pulvinic acids. Uh, in some place. I can check. Uh, there are other acids present in, in uh, binder and vessel. They study also the, the chemical composition of lexanum and they found that there are other uh, pigments there that are the ones that are acids that cause the, the, the reaction of, uh, of the to change from gray or to have a reddish or, or lilac colors. They are more common but not, they don't have pulvinic acid. So the blue is, uh, they also mentioned there the, the, the acid that can cause the blue. There is not like a blue staining in the lexinon as there is a blue staining in the bolids, you know, like you open and you can see that blue so quick. Here you can see like a permanent blue in so many, uh, in some of the types and that's caused by a different uh, pigment. So yes, the composition is different to bullets. Um, it was in some place in, in one of the uh, slides that I, I forgot to mention, but it was there. Yeah. Um, Randy inquired, um, can you comment on the edibility of Midwestern Lycium species? I have seen some reports of toxicity in scaber stalks. I cannot help with that because and I'm a mycologist, but I don't eat mushrooms that much. <laughs> so, but yes, it's something good to, to look forward.
to learn more about that. Probably Michael Kuo, he has more experience about that than me, but I cannot tell right now about which ones are edible or not. No. Okay, well, it, 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 you know what? Uh, just just as a, not that this is a criticism, don't take it that way, and it's not to you, Beatrice. But the other day, we got somebody who sent an email and said, what's the edibility of this, whatever this was? Mm -hmm. And I sent it to one of our uh, mushroom experts who turned around and said, I don't answer edibility questions. <laughs> so I think sometimes it's better to begin with, what is it? You could always look it up and learn, you yeah. know, but I think for some, some people, it kind of gets them frosty. Sorry, when you want help and then um, that's your question and ability. And in fact, you know, and it has the other piece uh, is sometimes these mushrooms are not all that interesting edibly. Yeah, you could say I ate a wild mushroom, but not necessarily, you know, there's some that do have some really good flavor profiles, but most of them, it's like, eh, you know, not a big deal. Dan, no. I know I asked you to unmute only because in case you wanted to add something, because I know you guys work together and, and I know, you know, it's always interesting to hear the dynamics between the mycologist of how everybody approaches their projects. Well, if you can hear me, I'll say I that can. one of the reasons that I got into mycology because I was interested in what you could eat and what you couldn't right. eat. And that right. was, and then of course, once you get deeper and deeper into that hole, you start to realize what Beatrice just showed of how complex it is. And so there have been reports of um, toxicity in like Sinem from Colorado, um, but it's really confusing. When you start to realize what you had just said, edibility all starts with, well, what are you eating? And, and what we saw here is that, um, there are so many different species that we don't know about, then often when somebody eats something, the report is that we got, okay, the person ate Lexinum or Antiacum or Lexinum, you know, these European names, and those are the two different things, the two different names that we tend to use. And the problem is we don't really know what the person ate because there's probably 20 or 30 different undescribed species out there. And so until some of this really foundational work is done to figure out what the different species are and then connect it back to, can you figure out what the more, how do you identify it in the field? It's really hard to gather the edibility data. And so th there are some reports definitely of people who have had uh, reactions to Lexinum, um, all of that. And these are very interesting that they're, they're gathered up by NAMA each year in terms of toxicity reports. Um, at the same time, every year there's toxicity reports for more, all the morels <laughs> and for uh, chicken of the woods. And so it, it's definitely, and it, people here, I'll just scan this, is, there's some of this coming in. Edibility is definitely related to location and substrate. It's located to which species you're eating. Um, and when we don't know the species, that's tough. Um, the location and substrate is definitely true. If you collect it from a golf course where someone has just sprayed something, that can be an issue collecting near the sides of roads, those kind of things. So edibility is just really complicated. And we tend to, um, as mycologists, who anyone who's responsible for saying is something edible or not, we tend to be really risk averse. And then we just tend towards, well, you should stick towards the Boletus edulis group because we know there's 25 different species possibly in, in that group also, but most of those don't seem to cause problems where it seems like some of the things in Lexinum uh, have been somewhat questionable. And then also like, um, you know, Catherine, like you said, there's, there's not a whole lot in genus Lexinum that to me, I truly go out of my way for relative to a chanterelle or a king bolete, as much as I admit I myself love um, some of the lexinums that I've collected, even though that they tend to have this oxidation. People have talked about this oxidation and a lot of them, we don't know what it is. But as you know, as you dry them and you cook them up, they look quite unappetizing typically by the time, <laughs> by the time you've, you've cooked them. So, that's, that's a long answer to that, just that we have a lot to learn. 
you know, and it's like sitting down at a Chinese dinner. There's somebody who's going to claim they're they're sensitive to MSG. There's somebody who has an allergy to this. You know, it's there's all sorts of reasons why you may or may not like something. Um, somebody inquired, with climate change, do you anticipate some species of boletes becoming more common in the Midwest? By the way, I don't know who wants to answer that. Yeah, that, that's a good question, but I, I cannot answer about it. Um, at the stage that we are in right now, we need to compare now more about how many species are out there, distribution, and consider those aspects. And hopefully, once we're, we're finished with this project, we should be able to know more about that. Um, I, child, I can see okay. the other question about the DNA and- Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the question for you. I assume DNA ITS is constant between the same mushroom growing in different locations slash microclimates. But how much variation is there in the appearance due to where it grows? Something to think about it and, and to be, to look forward to answer, you know, because uh, as I mentioned, right now we're just working and we don't know much about the ITS yet um, and, and how different it is between the species. When we, once we know that, then we can look at the different locations and see really if there's a pattern or not, or, or changes, you know, related to, to the climates <clears throat> where they grow. So most, most of the species from Michigan are related with, as, uh, grow with aspen and, and birch. So there might be a relation here with these species, but we need to check about the others and if there is variation with the others that have been growing with also other species also. So that's a question to answer later. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, Dan says ITS in Lacinum is insanely complicated because each individual carries multiple copies. So things get complicated quickly. Yes, and it's true. Um, just to obtain the ITS is difficult. Um, to obtain the ITS, you need good samples. And when you have dry specimens there, the DNA is probably damaged because of the way it was dry. I mean, or just being so long in a herbarium, the DNA can be damaged. And for, for what I recommend for, for Selexino or any bullets is to put a piece of fresh uh, context of, of the uh, collection in, in a buffer to later extract the DNA. And that really helps us. Uh, mycologists in obtain, to obtain the DNA or any person that is taught in them. So it's a, it's a challenge. So we see if I'm able to obtain more ITS one and, and then see how the variation is there. Because for the ITS two, I, I see that for those groups that work together, there, there is not a lot of variation there. And did you want to add anything? The, just that Lexinum may be like Cortinarius, one of those where there's just so many species that we just don't know about. Um, and that's what Beatrice was talking about buffer. For most people, unfortunately, it's hard for them to get hold of that buffer. And that's where if you um, get associated with some of your local clubs, um, people like Patrick Leacock or others can connect you to people who have um, some of these things on hand so that when we because really a lot of this work to move, move forward, um, what Beatrice is doing is the really hard work to get the DNA out of these old specimens. And that's exceptionally difficult. And so you try over and over and over because you need them because that was what the type specimen is. It's what people use to describe species. But a wonderful way to move forward is at um, when groups are out on their, uh, their forays, the more uh, current collections that people can get in where there's good tissue that can be put um, in a, a so the as a, an abbreviation for one of the buffers that we use is called CTAB. Um, it's a long chemical name, but it is something that preser preserves DNA and the abbreviation for it um, is based on an old name actually, but CTAB, it's usually a high salt solution combined with CTAB or other things. Um, they have, but there's a variety of these different sort of DNA protecting solutions. And if you can get it from the field into a tube quickly and into a freezer, it just, it makes um, life so much easier in terms of getting the DNA out of it. 
for these specimens that were preserved long ago, there's nothing that we can do. We just have to keep trying and trying and trying. But as um, to, to flesh out these trees that Beatrice was, was showing, um, it's great with these citizen scientist efforts as um, it's becoming more available to try and connect the local clubs. And when you get an interesting collection, hook up to uh, all of these people who help as interfaces between um, you know, the scientists sequencing the DNA um, and uh, the people out there collecting them uh, to get some of these things into, um, because you, you can't just, unfortunately, you can't just order it off the internet or there's no easy way to get it. Um, and I would say each, if you're in you know, Indiana, <laughs> there's people you can go to. If you're in Illinois, there's people you can go to or Wisconsin and try and hook up with your local club and uh, get to know the people who are working to preserve collections for um, scientific and they will, for scientific reasons, and they'll often hook you up with some of these tubes with a little bit of solution in it in case you get a really great or important collection. Too bad Patrick's not here tonight. Uh, he will no, go to another meeting. And he would be a good person to also talk about for these sort of networks, both within sort of your, the Illinois Mycological Association, and then these other networks of connecting with people um, like Indiana, I'm blanking on his name, um, Stephen Russell, is it yes. people like that who are really working on the citizen scientist aspect of it and having people mailing things to people so that they can mail it back to help get these uh, DNA, get DNA sequence from fresh specimens. I meant Michael Colesman mentioned a few times tonight. Is he one of those people that people should be sending stuff to as well? Or it's better to do this through Patrick and Beatrice and uh, Russell? No, if you know Michael, yes, he, he would be glad to receive some specimens. Yeah. Okay. And communicate with him and, and, and plan how to, you know, try then and yeah, it would be good to have some notes on uh, the host and some voucher information, you know, and, 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 and send us the specimens. Mm -hmm. uh, Randy inquired, what's the buffer to preserve the DNA? Which you sort of mentioned, Dan, but maybe there's something specific. I don't know. Well, yeah. <laughs> then I'm <ready> to, yeah. <laughs> That's where it gets into that there's a bunch of different ones. Some that you can buy in kits and they won't tell you what's in it. Um, and others that we kind of do as homebrew ourselves, which is typically like a 2% CTAB solution with a really high salt concentration. Um, but, and I don't want to scare people that it has to get into the tube within minutes of collecting it. Um, as Beatrice was saying, if you dry it down and get it to Michael Quo, a specimen that's a month old that was sort of carefully dried, um, is way better than a specimen from the 1950s or 60s. And so in a, in a perfect world, you can, collect, you can take a chunk of it and put some of it in the buffer right away. But even if you put it in your food dehydrator um, and have good notes and all of that, that specimen, there's a much higher likelihood that the DNA will be in good condition than um, one that is, is really old. And generally, the, the more gentle, the better. Um, if you can set your dehydrator to the lowest possible setting that will dry it without it molding. Um, sometimes for edibility, I just want my things dried and I don't care. So I crank my, my dryer up to the pop, hottest possible temperature and they get crispy. Um, and, and that's great sometimes when you're in a rush and you just want to eat the things and you don't care. For the scientific specimens, if you're hoping that someone can get DNA out of it later, if you can set it down to the herb setting or um, the lowest possible setting, even sometimes just putting it in front of moving a fan um, with moving air, uh, and that even if it dries slowly, that will often be better for preserving the DNA. Okay, so a slow drying cycle with the least amount of heat possible. Uh, okay, because the heat would damage the DNA? It tends to. Well, that's useful to know. It's not, there are some things, and again, then there are other species that go against the rule. You can dry them to a crisp and still get DNA out of them without any problem. Um, and those tend to be the ones that are probably the least problematic in terms of some of what like Beatrice was describing of that they don't have a lot of crazy variation in the ITS or those kind of things. Um, but for some of the ones that are more difficult, um, yeah, the, the gentler, the better for drying things. I didn't know that, that's useful. Beatrice, this has been terrific. Are there any more questions, everybody?
because you were so thorough and detailed. You know, <laughs> sometimes sometimes there's no question because you answered it. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I'm learning about the genus, you know, I'm learning about all this process, and it's good to learn. Hopefully, oh, we'll make a good contribution about the exinion at the end of this. <laughs> Ah, uh, they said perhaps, oh, uh, Stephanie said perhaps Beatrice or Daniel might mention some of the voucher type information that should be included if someone were to send in a specimen to the mycologists. Yes, I mean, um, a good voucher would have date, host. Um, you talking you about plant host? Plant host, yeah, plant host and the date. Um, if you can make some quick notes about it, in general colors, I mean, because some, there are some characteristics that you are gonna lose, you know, when you dry the specimens. And in, in this case, uh, the, the oxidation, you know, when, once you cut it in, in a half and see if there is any change in color, that will help to place them, you know, even though we don't know how important that is, but our characteristics that we're considering right now. Uh, and Dan includes photos are photos. great and everything else. <laughs> Yeah, probably what a GPS location as well. If you, I mean, if you have time to make some quick notes, it's good to have some quick notes, uh, morphological characters. Um, when I was describing in Belize, I mean, we took time to, to see all those details, you know, and sometimes spend half hour, an hour uh, describing collections. Uh, it's good because then you can compare that morphological characters with others in case that helped, but yes, they're just to look for a description and, and morphological characters that you can take at hand, uh, colors, uh, ox, uh, in this case, cavers. I mean, if, if they have a um, immature collection or matures collection, to see the changes in color, pilos, type, hymenophore, that's good, that helps. That was a useful question, Stephanie. Well, I think we have come to the end, but in Beatrice, this was great. And I hope your family learned a lot about what you do. Because she did, she practiced this presentation with her family who were interested to learn what she does. Yeah, they, they don't understand what I'm doing, but at least they saw the pictures and they like it. And, but yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And yes, I need to continue working and probably next year I will have more results to share. That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. And Dan, again, thank you for the recommendation. I'm sure you're pleased with the efforts you made tonight. And uh, we will see everybody. I know there's a foray coming up. Those of you who are members have the information because it came in the email today. And uh, please do support the Chicago Botanic Garden Program because that's our, our big public outreach every year. And uh, Beatrice, again, thank you so much. Thank we you. Look forward to meeting you again. Thanks to you and for everyone to connect and to stay there listening. I'm not much of a speaker, but I I like to share what I have been learning and 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 I mean it's it's interesting. Bullets are amazing. I love them. <laughs> definitely, definitely, and uh, thanks again. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.